Greetings, I'm Shad, and I love learning. Though I should probably clarify that uh, to say I love learning things that I am interested in, because learning about things that I'm not interested in, say, you know, the American Revolution. No offense to those who, you know, have a passion for that period of history, but for me, I, I, just, I would have a passing interest for it, but I don't have a passion. I, I, and so, you know, when it gets to the real dry stuff, I'm like, you know, yeah, it can be a bit boring. But for things that I'm interested in, like swords and knights and castles and science fiction and or just science and you know, oh, yeah, heaps of stuff, right? And so as someone who loves learning about things that I love, you always learn new things, and your knowledge base is a continually evolving thing, especially when new information arises or you hear something you haven't heard before, and so new things come in and old things get thrown out the window. And so because of that, it is just unavoidably, you're eventually going to come across many things that you once believed to be true that are now untrue. And if you're in a position where you were trying to share your opinions and things you loved, you have probably said things that have been inaccurate. And of course, that is something that I have done many times in the past. And as a YouTuber, I have YouTube videos with statements here and there that I have now learned to be factually incorrect. Things, and I've learned them to be incorrect either from my own study or from other people pointing them out. But you might not be aware of those things, which is the purpose of this video. I'm going to share with you some of the things that I have said that I have later learned to be incorrect completely or even perhaps a bit out of context. So I'm going to share what the truth is with you or at least the correct context in which it should be understood in things I've said in the past. Not everything, just the things that either need clarification or have been wrong. I should say, if there are some of you, who my viewers, regular viewers or subscribers, who have disagreed with some of the things I have shared and tried to correct me on them in the comments below and I do not mention them in this video, that could be the result of a number of things. I disagreed with you, okay, I looked at your evidence, I still disagree, so that could be one thing. The other thing is that I just didn't see your comment. Uh, if you have a look, there can be quite a lot of them, all right? Especially if it's a while after I've posted the video. When I first post videos, I usually try and uh, you know, watch the comments quite uh, closely. But then, uh, you know, if it's been a, a week or a month after, it's very easy to get lost within the schloo in the, in the crowd, is a better way, lost within the crowd. So my apologies if you feel neglected or I haven't addressed your objections, but those are the reasons. I might still just disagree with you or I just haven't seen it. Having said that, there is a small minority of commenters who raise objections who just didn't watch the video closely enough and they just completely missed the context. That is at least clear enough for most people to understand. So there are some arguments that, uh, you know, the a small majority of you raise that are actually invalid because you just need to watch the video a bit more closely and understand what I'm saying. And in extension to that, this video is the appropriate place to kind of just mention uh, how I kind of handle uh, comments and other things like that. I, I try and read, to my, the best of my ability, all the comments and stuff like that. And in regards to the comments where people raise objections or disagreements or arguments with things I say, I have no problem with that at all. In fact, I really like it because I prefer to know what is true than to being right. And if I am wrong about something, I want to know about it. So I have no objection with you guys raising objections to things I've said. In fact, I love it, especially if I am actually wrong. I prefer it and want it if I am wrong. I want to know, and me making this video, I hope, is a bit of evidence in regards to that. But if you're going to be a jerk at the same time, well, even if you're right or wrong, I just will ignore you because there's this wonderful choice that every person has the right to make. And that's not to, you know, pay attention to jerks. It's a wonderful thing. I highly recommend you do it. If you ever come across a jerk, just ignore them. You don't need to engage with them. And, you know, because oftentimes when people are being particularly inflammatory or derogatory or insultive and stuff like that, they just want attention. And so the best thing you do is just not even, you know, don't feed the bear. Let them starve in their own resentment and disgruntlement and go on and have a happy life. And it's a fairly basic thing. You'd think, you know, people would understand this, but I guess only people of a certain maturity do understand that when you want to engage in an argument with someone or everything like that, you do it respectfully. It's, it's pretty simple. And if you do it respectfully, I, I have not only do I have no problem with engaging and listening to what you're saying, I enjoy it. I want it. I want to know if I'm wrong when I'm wrong. So to kick us off, butted mail. That is mail that is wrapped around someone's butt like a loincloth. That is incorrect. Butted mail... Sorry, I've never even said that. No, butted mail is uh, 
the ring, the, the rings that they wear, the rings in mail, when they are just buttoned together and they're not riveted together, okay? So I have said, specifically in my video, The Truth About Mail, I said that buttered mail was not a historical thing. Well, I have later learned that that is actually incorrect. I have found proper historical, you know, surviving examples of buttered mail. There you go. I was I was wrong. Butted mail was a real historical thing. Though I stand by everything else I said in my video is that it is profoundly more ineffective than riveted mail. Riveted mail is the thing that you would always want to get if you ever had the choice between the two. As to how common it was, well, from the, uh, you know, surviving examples that I found, there's far less examples of butted mail than riveted mail, which is what drew me to the original opinion that riveted mail was the only historical thing, because that was the only thing I ever saw in historical examples. So, that, of course, that was the conclusion I drew. My new conclusion is that because there's far less cases of butted mail, historical butted mail, than riveted mail, is that it was far more uncommon than riveted mail for obvious reasons, because riveted mail is so much more superior, you know, with all my good English uses words. I'm Australian, all right? We're so good at butchering languages. Look what we're doing to English. Anyway, I'll get to the thing about my Australian ways. Riveted mail, so much better than butted mail. So that's why I feel there's more cases of riveted mail than butted mail. Next subject, and because I kind of led into it, pronunciation of words. Guys, you, you don't need to tell me. Like, well, you can, I won't stop you, because I know you love doing it. <laughs> but no one knows, no one is more keenly aware of the fact that I am so capable of mispronouncing names and words of other languages than myself. I know that more than anyone. And I blame my Australian heritage for that. As I kind of mentioned before, we Australians are masters at butchering languages. L look at what we've done to English, okay? And I actually, this is not just, I don't just say that as a joke, it's actually an opinion I have, all right? Because the Australian accent is horrible. It's an absolute mess. And I say that from experience, all right? When I was a Mormon missionary, I'm still a Mormon, but when I was a full-time time missionary for my church, we would have missionaries that, and I served in Australia, by the way, uh, Sydney, Sydney area, Sydney North, we would have missionaries that would come over from America, and they wouldn't understand what we were saying. Like, they thought we were speaking another language, us Australians, because our accent is just so messed up. And you might just, you know, chalk that up as being an American thing. Americans just can't understand Australians, but it wasn't just Americans, it was really every, everyone from another country. And I served in the Sydney North area, uh, and that is so, like such a multicultural area, especially when I served in Parramatta, the Parramatta area. And so I was dealing with a lot of people with broken English and stuff like that. And it was so hard to get them to understand what I was saying. I actually had to actively speak better than what I used to, round my words a bit. And I do this for you, and that's actually become a lifelong thing to the point, and you will hear my accent, I'm sure a lot of you will, but a lot of Australians think I sound American because I actually ha have actively changed the way I speak to be a bit more pronounced and clear. So even though I butcher words, well, I actually, you know, I'm doing a bit of a favor because I ha have tried to improve it a bit. So yes, the Australian accent is just a dog's breakfast. I'm I'm more aware of that than anyone. And I have actively taken steps to try and improve my speech, but in the end of the day, I still am Australian and I'll still say words in the Australian way and butcher other, you know, words in other languages. What are some of the words that you guys have been particularly keen on correcting me about? Well, first of all, in my Truth About the Ninja video, it was ninjutsu. Ah, I said it wrong! You see, I know people are like, ah, I, said I know, you guys, it's ninjutsu. Thank you for correcting me. I know that now. I'll try and say it more correctly in the future. Ninjutsu. The other word, of course, is... Uh, I'll, try and, I'll try and say it right from the get-go. Neusch... No, Neuschwanstein. Hey? Did I get it? I'll try it again. Neuschwanstein. Neuschwanstein. I hope, all right, there you go. That, that was my attempt. And for those of you who haven't watched the video, The Castle, Reality vs. Fantasy, uh, I pronounced Neuschwanstein as Noschwanstein. That, that was my Australian attempt at it, Noschwanstein. But seriously, <laughs> I wish I could have recorded the first attempts at me trying that word when I first learned about Neuschwanstein. Yeah, I, it was years ago, of course, but I, I saw the word. I couldn't even read it when I first saw it. I was like, no, no, so I was 
Now, and no joke, for like almost a year after even learning about Neuschwanstein, I, I couldn't say the word. I would just say, it's that Neu blah 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 da castle. <laughs> so if you think Neuschwanstein was bad, you should have heard what I was like before then. <laughs> So Noschwenstein was actually a good attempt at it, all right? But still, I'm grateful for you guys for correcting me. Now I know it is Neuschwanstein. It's Neuschwanstein. The next thing that I've said in one of my videos that I've learned to be completely incorrect was the use of shields in uh, historical Japan. In uh, When I did my... Uh, historical or realism review of the video game For Honor, I said that uh, shields were never a thing in Japan. I've since learned that to be correct. And I should really state who, who has helped me, you know, um, uh, correct me in my incorrect understanding. So if I go back to the mail thing, there was a number of people, several commenters uh, were, uh, you know, pointed out some historical examples of buttered mail. Very grateful to you for that. And also Lloyd of Lindy Beige, he made a video on uh, plated mail, so plates in mail, and he shows, a, you know, a very clear as day, a uh, historical example of butted mail. So I'm also very grateful to you, Lloyd, for correcting me in that. And if we go back onto Shields, of course, it was Metatron who corrected me on this factoid as well, as well as Anthony Cummins, because um, Metatron then did a follow-up video uh, with Anthony uh, in regards to uh, uh, samurais actually using shields, because Metatron's point was that shields were used, but before the medieval, uh, sorry, before the samurai period. And then Anthony comes and points out, well, no, shields are also even used by samurai uh, as well. Now, as to the prevalence, it's, it seems, okay, from my observations that uh, shields are still very, very rare. More common before the samurai period, but even with the samurais, they used kind of either shields or shield-like objects. And in some cases, it was katana and shield. Very rare, okay? But some good historical examples that they share. And of course, I'll, I'll link the videos in the description below. The next subject, Shallow curves in swords. <laughs> this is a fun one because really nothing have I ever said on, on any of my YouTube videos that have been more contentious than that opinion. And it is this, that shallow curves on swords, very slight shallow ones, are more detrimental than beneficial. I uh, say that in a big way in my Katana series, part five. I made a whole video on it, it is in why the Katana has a curve. That's another separate video. And I also mention it again in my Falchion and Messer series, part five four of that series. First of all, in regards to the katana's curve, there are so many people, so many people are very, very quick to point out that the reason why the katana has a curve is because of the forging process. Now, I don't mention the forging process at all in the video why the katana has a curve, which was an oversight on my part because I should have, and because I'm keenly aware of it. I actually, that's the very thing I say in my katana series, part five, I, I say full on that the reason, the whole reason the katana has a curve is actually the quench process and that it was unintentional. But this is the thing, then someone, uh, one of my commenters, uh, mentioned that actually if they really really wanted a straight sword they still could have made it even with the quenching process. They would have just forged the sword with an inverse curve, quenched it, and get it to be straight after the quench. Now that is a very fiddly process and I think one of the big reasons they didn't do that is probably because it's too fiddly, but it's still possible. And so in my opinion that actually meant well perhaps there is still some reason or you know why they kept the curve if there was a way to take away the curve. The other reason why I wanted to address that in that video is because there are many swords that aren't differentially hardened and quenched that way that are still curved. Katanas and Guess what? There were katanas that were not differentially hardened or quenched that way that still have curves in them. Are they real katanas? Well, they were made by the Japanese in their actual history. They still have curves. So I addressed that video um, in the sense of why the curve was there, not mentioning about the you know, quenching process. And many, many people are very, very quick to point out that it is the quenching process, and I tried to put a note on the video doesn't seem like a lot of people see it, but to address those people that are disagreeing with my opinions in that video, I am just saying, of course, I have read all your comments, and there's a lot of them saying that it's the differential hardening process. I think most of these comments are people that are new to my videos and channels and haven't seen the other stuff, or and so then, of course, they are thinking that I'm not aware of it. Well, rest assured that I am, and the question still stands. And I do feel that looks have a big part to play because it looks so much better than if it was straight. And in regards to the katana specifically, that it's too fiddly, too much of a pain in the butt to try and make it straight through the different 
differential hiding process. That, of course, I still feel plays an important role, but you can make it without, so the question still stands. Now, in regards to just all swords everywhere, European included, shallow curves in swords, many of you still, still feel that there is benefit to it. And like I said in my uh, Falchion and Messer series, I uh, have, you know, read all your arguments, stuff like that, and I'm mostly uh, still of the same opinion. And I think it needs to be mentioned that you really need to understand what curves we're talking about. Is it is it a slight curve where it's only a couple degrees off centre? Because that, honestly, who could say that has a benefit? It does nothing. It is so close to being straight. And that's really what I'm saying. Whenever I say, share this opinion, I'm not talking about katanas or swords that have excessive curve. I'm talking about shallow curve. Now, e there are some of you who do understand that, that I am talking about shallow curves and still feel that it has more benefit, and you've shared some arguments. And I have read the arguments, and the one that I find to be uh, uh, most compelling, to have a uh, most possibility of being correct, or and possibility of me altering my opinion, is the arguments that talk about edge alignment. Uh, there are some of you who feel that even a slight curve, that even a, a very small minute curve can have a very significant effect on edge alignment when using the sword in striking. That could be true. I don't know it is, therefore I haven't changed my opinion based on that yet. I want to actually do some tests. And I'll be making a video on that very subject. It's going to be why the katana has a curve or even just why swords have a curve, part two, whatever. Addressing that very subject where I'm actually going to be doing some practical tests to really see if slight curves can have a benefit like in edge alignment. So in regards to that argument, you know, haven't formed an opinion yet, which is why I, my opinion hasn't changed and why I haven't addressed it either. Next up is my statement about stirrups. Well, I've actually made a whole video addressing that subject in regards to if stirrups were the thing that kicked off the development of shock cavalry and therefore the rise of the knight. But because that is a retraction I've made, I'll state it here as well, I feel that statement is incorrect. It wasn't because of the stirrup. After doing more research, I feel it was actually the gradual development of uh, uh, technology, also understanding and uh, uh, just applications of how horses can be used in combat as well as social conditions that kicked off shock cavalry and the rise of the knight. In my video The Truth About Ninjas I state that uh, true ninjutsu, ninjutsu, look if I'm still saying it wrong I'm Australian you just can have to deal with it guys okay, but I say that true ninjutsu was never a fighting style. Some of you have disagreed with that. I stand by it and I need to clarify what I'm saying. When I say that, I'm not saying that ninjas uh, didn't know how to fight. I actually feel that most ninjas would have wanted to know how to fight and probably did. But what the thing that defined a ninja wasn't knowing how to fight. It was if you acted like a spy or not. That's the defining thing. So if you found someone who was just really, really good at martial arts, that didn't make him a ninja. Even if he wore the mask and he had a sword or anything like that, that's not what made him a ninja. It was if he performed the role of a spy. That's what defined him as a ninja. And of course, knowing how to fight would really help assist that. And there was probably many Many cases where they performed assassinations as well. It's just not the defining characteristic, okay? You could have a peasant who acted like a spy and they are a, legit <laughs> a legitimate ninja. And when I say that, I'm not saying that all ninjas were peasants who didn't know how to fight, okay? When I say that, I'm saying you could have a peasant who didn't know how to fight, who acted like a spy, and they would be a ninja. The next subject is more a point of clarification than retraction, and that is in regards to my video, Single vs. Double-Edged Swords. Many of you disagreed with me, and you're perfectly entitled to, and I'm not actually here to change your opinion, because after listening to your arguments, I feel that some of um, the conclusions that I've drawn are very much opinion based and it's really what your preferences are. So even though I say that I feel single-edged swords have the potential to be superior than double-edged swords and therefore are superior, I admit now that a lot of that does come down to how effective you feel having a back edge is on a sword. For me, I mentioned it's not a game changer, but for you, you might employ it quite a lot. And if you do, that means having a back edge, well again, is far, far more important and that could outweigh the pros and cons that I outlined in that video, making a double-edged sword superior for you than it would be for me. So I stand by everything else I said in that video, that I think the points of a single-edged sword still have far more potential to be superior in cutting capacity and other things like that. Again though, 
that might not outweigh the benefits from a back edge if you use the back edge a lot more than I use it. And there you go, those are some of the facts that I wanted to mention that I either got wrong or needed clarification. I might have missed many of them, okay, and I might have even missed some of the um, uh, comments that you have shared where you wanted to challenge me in some of the statements that I've made. Sorry if I have, but guess what? Of course, I'm going to make another one of these videos. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, learning is a lifelong thing, especially on something you're passionate about. I'm always going to be trying to learn as much as possible about all the things that you find on Shadowversity. And throughout that process, I can guarantee that I'm going to get other things wrong or learn things that I've already said are not absolutely correct. And when that happens, I will, of course, share them with you. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And until next time, farewell. If you would like to support Shadowversity or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.